So typically you've told us that you don't outline your books. You don't outline. In this one, did you do any kind of prep to know all the little things you had to wrap up because you're wrapping up a series? Welcome to Book Reporter Talks To, where our latest guest is Karen White, who is a repeat guest. We enjoyed talking to her so much the last time. I just finished the new book in her Trad Street series, which is The Attic on Queen Street. For those of you who have not read the series, you want to sit down and start reading right now. Uh, they're in for a great treat. And we're going to be talking about what's next in her solo career, as well as her writing with Beatrice Williams and Lauren Willick. So welcome, Karen. We can't wait to hear what you've been up to. Not sleeping, that's for sure. <laughs> exactly. You've had this crazy tour. So let's start with The Attic on Queen Street was mm -hmm. such a great wrap up to the series. But let's start with you giving a little bit of background on the series for anybody who hasn't figured it out to read these books yet. Mm hmm. So um, the first book, The House on Tragedy, came out in 2008, hard to, be hard to believe. Um, um, and it is basically, the, the protagonist is Melanie Middleton, who when she came to me, she came to me fully formed. And I knew immediately when she jumped into my head that she was OCD. I knew that uh, she was a realtor whose, whose bread and butter was historic real estate. But I also knew that she hated old houses. And the reason why she hates old houses is because old houses always have a spirit or two or sometimes three who want her help in solving a mystery or unfinished business because Melanie was born with the ability to communicate with the dead. And she's not pleased with this. And, and through her life, she has learned how to block them out um, by generally singing an ABBA song very loudly. Um, but when she inherits this house in the first book, we know that her blocking out spirits is no longer an option, especially when she meets uh, Jack Trenum, a too good looking and too, char too charming author of uh, true crime, who at the time that she inherits the house on Trad Street um, is investigating and writing about the disappearance of a woman who lived in the house in the 20s and is rumored to have abandoned her husband and son um, to run off with a lover. But the uh, son, now an elderly gentleman, who is the person who leaves her the house, um, never believed that to be true and knows that Melanie is now the person to solve the mystery. So she and Jack get together to solve this mystery. And that is the kicking off start for the Trad Street series. And it's so much fun of like where they evolve and where they go from there because she's a fun character, but let's go with where we left off. We left off in the Christmas on Trad Street and Melanie, her husband, Jack had separated. And while yeah. readers want to see this resolved, oh no, we love that there's no quick ending to this. <laughs> and rather we're, we're inside this marriage and we're going to see what happened between them. Did you like writing this tension between them of, Okay, how are they both feeling about this marriage right now? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And, and the reason why I left the Christmas spirits on Trad Street where I did, because I knew there was going to be one more. Apparently, many of my readers did not because I got a lot of emails. But um, <laughs> I knew that Jack and Melanie are meant for each other and they know they're meant for each other. They just don't know how to make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, because yes, when we first meet Melanie in the first book, she's alone. She has no love life. She has no family. She's estranged from everybody in her family. There's some family members she's not even aware of, you know? And by the time we get to the seventh book or even the sex, sixth book, her sphere of family and friends has expanded exponentially. And now she's a lot more invested. Her heart has expanded. Um, you know, and yeah, so by the time we get to the seventh book, it's time for Melanie and Jack to really turn the focus inward and, and discover that they're both at fault mm -hmm. and, and figure out what needs fixing and what doesn't need fixing. And that's why I think that readers will really enjoy how this book plays out because it's not easy. You mm -hmm. can't just say, oh, I was wrong. Forgive me. I mean, that's easy. It has to be a little more 
thought out, more planned out. And plus I have to uh, torture Jack and Melanie a little bit in this book. So and you definitely <laughs> do. But you know, I love this line about marriage. We don't always marry someone we can live with. We marry someone we can't live without. Love yeah. that line. Yeah. And later Jack says, you drive me crazy, but I can't imagine life without you. But then he's got all these times where he pushes and pulls her, even in this relationship. And mm -hmm. I think that people, anybody in a long time marriage can understand both of those lines, especially mm -hmm. this week we're doing Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if yeah. I ask one more question, it might be, why did I marry this woman? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but I really yes. feel you're looking at that. You're taking this look at, okay, marriage is not this all like, you know, fabulous thing, but could you live with this person or without them? Mm -hmm. No, and 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 that's it, and and that's the thing. A lot of people say, "Oh, I haven't read the Trad Street series because it's it's ghost stories," but that's the thing. This whole series, each individual book, even it, they're very character driven. The rest of the stuff is backstory. It is subplot. It's really about the relationships we have: mother, father, daughter relationships, sister relationships, daughter, you know, children relationships. Um, it's, it's all of that. And I think that's what drives the story. So, you know, marriage, I mean, I've been married for over 30 years. It is not a cut and dried thing. It's, it's not easy and there are good times and there's not so good times. And, um, obviously whether, you know, and we all agree that Melanie and Jack are made for each other, but can they find a way to live with each other? Because I know they can't live without each other. Mm -hmm. Especially with the twins and his, or his daughters living with right. them. There's just mm -hmm. a lot going on at once. It's just a mm -hmm. lot going on. Mm -hmm. You know, and the filming, you know, there's the filming in their house <laughs> with their mutual enemy, Mark Longo, you know. <laughs> but you know what I do have to say is I'm not into supernatural. I'm not into ghosts. I'm not into books that, you know, have those kinds of themes. And I absolutely loved the books. I mean, I absolutely love because it is character driven. There's also something I noticed on your page. You can't rush reading because there are little nuggets that are throughout <laughs> that if you go too quickly, you're going to miss them. And you're going to miss what Karen's really doing here, folks. If you really pay close reading, remember when you were in school, they said, do close reading on these pages. And what I find is that like each paragraph kind of matters as you're going on because it's building the story the whole time. So, so I also learned some of that something I didn't know called frozen Charlotte's show yes. up in the book. So tell us about, because there's always this great historical information about what's going on in Charleston. So what is a frozen Charlotte? Well, it, interesting because I'd never heard of it either. And I was actually Googling something else. And that's where I get the best. People ask if I have other people do my research. And I say no, because I find these serendipitous nuggets that I am able to put into books because I don't know about them before I start looking for something. And I can't even remember what I was originally Googling, but I found it was a little clickbait. I think it had the picture of a frozen Charlotte in her little coffin. I'm like, that is hideous. What is that? <laughs> and I clicked on it. And so Victorians were a very strange generation. Um, they were very morbid um, and they did things like make jewelry out of the deceased person's hair. Um, they were really into taxidermy and making anthropomorphic um, like scenes with dead animals. I mean, go look it up. It's, mm. they were, you know, and the uh, post-mortem photographs where they would pose a dead child with the living children, mm. um, you know, propped up with like their eyes open or it bizarre. So I wasn't all that surprised when I clicked on this frozen Charlotte and it's from a little song that was meant to be a warning for children about a girl named Charlotte who didn't listen to her mother um, and, and wear a proper coat to a party when it was really, really cold outside and she ended up getting a chill and then dying of pneumonia. Um, <laughs> You know, so it was a warning about you should listen to your mother. <laughs> and so they became like popular little figurines. They're these almost like cupy looking dolls. Um, they're naked, but without, you know, genitalia, like Barbies, remember? Mm -hmm. Ken's, you, there were no genitalia. And um, 
Some of them came in their own little coffins and some of them were just, you know, bare and they would put them in birthday cakes. And they, I mean, really Victorians, it's that appropriate child giving that, yeah, they were child childhood playthings. And I just think very strange, but when I clicked on it, I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to use this, but I have to use this because this is really great and really bizarre. So, yeah. I think that comes head from being so corseted. These people were just like, my wife is so constricted. How can I need to give me the attention? What can oh, I do yeah. to them to torture oh, them? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It was really, and there was button collection, lots of Victorian buttons. Yes. So so that's tell us about thing. your research on those. So, you know, it might have been, well, so they're called charm strings. And I think I was reading an article in Charleston Magazine, because I think they had one at the Charleston Museum or something like that. And it was so fascinating because what they were that, you know, adolescent girl, this is, remember, this is before Instagram and YouTube and TikTok. (laughs) And um, so adolescent girls, what they would do, they would get like a leather string or something. And whenever they would find a spare button, they would put it on it. And when they got to the 100th or 1000th, I can't remember anymore, that was when they would meet their their future love. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, really, they didn't need dating sites. They just needed the buttons going on the string. If we only knew. Exactly. Maybe people should take this up right now, except buttons are on no clothes anymore. I, so I they'll never meet anybody. I know, but you know, but it'll keep them busy and off of TikTok, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Isn't it really like insane what you're seeing, the numbers of people that are on TikTok? Hey, okay. Full disclosure, I now have my own TikTok account. I must go watch. I must go watch and see what you're doing. Yeah. Really? Um, yeah. A mm. lot of authors are migrating to this. Everybody said to me, I should have a TikTok account. And I was like, I need to see what other grownups are doing first. I, I, I know, I know. And it's embarrassing. And I do have, I have a 23-year-old helping me with mine because mm. I'm not cool enough. Wow. Or I am cool enough, but the thing is, the time factor and the brain cell factor Mm -hmm. because at the end of the day I need to have written words because if I don't write the book Mm -hmm. there's no reason to have any social media you know exactly it's exactly so my focus should always be getting the pages written and so I'm not on social media as much as like my publisher would like me to be Mm -hmm. so I do need help and I have found help and and she's wonderful, um, you know, and, and I send her pictures and then she just makes everything happen. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. You know, you have to get to this point where what are we really doing all day long? And then if you click on something, I was out on TikTok and I don't know how I ended up looking at a gender reveal party. I mean, my kids aren't married. We're nowhere near this. I watched one and now every time I log on, I get like 12 of them <laughs> sent to me. And it also becomes really addicting to watch people you don't know. Like, I don't know who these people are and they're revealing like their triplets are being born. And now I'm watching this. I'm like, I why am I with watching me, this? With me, it's Instagram and dog videos. <laughs> right? I mean, an hour later, like, and this is why we're all ADD. I will go to Instagram to check on a post to respond to, to things. And I see somebody, because I've watched one dog video, now that's all I get anymore. And an hour later, I've watched like, you know, a hundred dog videos and I'm sharing them with everybody. I'm, and I'm thinking, was this a good use of your time, Karen? <laughs> no, but I yeah, had fun. So <laughs> it's fun, but it's also, why don't they think everything I'm interested in, like cooking books this, and give me a little bit of each of it, but no, they get stuck on this one thread. You get dogs and I get gender reveal parties and that's what you're going to get. And I know it's, it's really, it's frightening. It's frightening. <laughs> we are adult women who know better. What about these long, young new ingenues who are, you know, 13 and, you know, all of a sudden they're sucked in by the influencers. I know. That makes me feel very old because I'm like, you know, don't walk across my lawn. I mean, it's the same kind of thing, right? But it's now with social media. I just, I don't know. I would rather see children playing in the cul-de-sac again. I know, but it's really true because it's like the whole thing. I don't know. It's actually a question I was going to touch on with you later about how do you balance it all? And it's really hard to be balancing it all because 
every new thing that comes along that we hear that all of a sudden 1 million people are friends or 36 million people are friends with this person. Now you're supposed to be doing that too. And I'm like, I'm not going to find 13 million people to care about what I want at all. <laughs> no, no. I mean, because my personal life is so boring. <laughs> it's, you know, I just, I could, I could curate it. So it looks like I had this fabulous, perfect life, but you know what? There's a lot of schlepping involved in my life. There's a lot exactly. of you know, details that are just not sexy. And um, like I could give you a tour of my house and see all the 50 million unpacked boxes from my recent move. That's not sexy. I can't make it sexy. No. Um, it's just real life. And I don't think people don't want to walk, watch real life. They want to watch your curated life. Mm -hmm. And that's just not who I am. And I just, I have a struggle with it. And I will say that when my kids were home, before the whole social media frenzy, I mean, my kids were, and your kids, they're about the same age. Yeah. They were the last generation to be raised with normal childhoods before the social media mm -hmm. bombardment. And I got, I was so much more productive because my kids would go to school, my husband would go to work. And I knew that I would have between this hour and this hour to work. Mm -hmm. And there was no social media I had to be doing. There was nothing but the work. And it was wonderful. And then my kids, I would go pick up my kids at school, then drive them to wherever. And it was, it was wonderful. Um, and now it is the constant barrage. And that's not to say I don't love hearing from readers. I love hearing from readers. But now they're like sending me Facebook messages and it's Instagram messages and their Instagram posts, there's email posts, there's TikTok posts, there's so I have to spend hours a day just finding the messages and I just find it exhausting, you know, and, and just time consuming. And it's not that it's a horrible thing. I mean, hearing from readers, that is, it's such a blessing that I have readers and I feel guilty when I don't find them, you know, mm -hmm. when I can't reply to them. It's just, I, I don't know how to find that balance right now because social media has just become so pervasive and so everything. Mm -hmm. I would agree with you. And I'm seeing that like, even on our sites, I feel like I'm responding to reader mail. I'm responding to this. I'm making sure if we put up a post that I'm responding to the post, oh, the link is wrong. Oh, well, let me give you the right link. By the time you get done at the end of the day, you have just no there, time like, to do the real work. Where's your you at stuff? Yeah. What have I not done? Because I've been doing all these other things. Of, of and, and the thing is, now you can promote yourself, which is before it used to be, it had to be a full page ad in the New York Times, which now right. nobody is reading the print. So like, right. can't, don't even care about that. But it's right. what are you going to do? And what actually starts to matter? Like, what are the things, are you talking to the same 10 people over and over? How many people are going and looking right. at this? And sometimes right. I feel we have to do that pullback and go, really, where is, no, what are we influencing? And, and also, why am I promoting me? should I be promoting my books? Mm -hmm. Because I'm only the author. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my books are a lot more exciting than I am. <laughs> so, I mean, sure, when I'm on book tour, I love to share those posts of, you know, meeting people and being in Charleston. And, mm -hmm. but the rest of my life, I'm a very private person. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I want to wear sweats and write and be with my husband and my children, my dogs. I don't want to have to put on makeup every day and try to look decent because it's a struggle. <laughs> it really is. But there is like so much going on. And I think that there, there is this balance. And I, don't, I think we're out of balance right now. I think we're way we're out of balance. Horribly and, out of balance. And here's horribly. what's really interesting. I don't know if this is going on with your kids, but it's going on with mine. They're pulling back from social media. Oh, they're, yes. They're pulling 100%. back a what they wanted people to know about them. They're dropping accounts right and left. Mm -hmm. There are, I'm, I'm curating, I'm only doing this. I'm not doing that. I mean, very, very much yeah. so. So, but I think it's because our kids are that last generation yeah. of before, like they remember the calm sanity of life before the social media. Mm -hmm. So they know that it exists. And I think that's why they are able to do it because my kids are doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. But it's the children who are a little younger, the early 20s. That's all they've ever known. They don't know what it's like to live in a world without it. You know, what's really scary, too, is like kids that are in middle school and, you know, beginning of high school and stuff. That can be a I mean, vulnerable time. Emotionally. It's, oh, it's got to be brutal. 
absolutely yeah. brutal and ruthless. You know, you hear how but the kids are getting so many more issues. I mean, especially last year when everybody was home. I can't even fathom what all of this is like. I really, I don't know. I don't know. Our kids would have loved it because they're like, great, more time to go outside and play in the cul-de-sac, right? <laughs> like, my daughter would be like, more time to read books, you know? It's yeah, it'd be totally great. This would be really, really good. You know? But, you know, back to the books for a second. You touch on these endless details that go into restoration. And mm -hmm. does any of this surprise you? Because I was thinking specifically about bricks and mortar, like mm -hmm. mortar and why you have to care about using the right mortar, which I had never thought about till I read this book. And I have to tell you, so, you know, my daughter has a master's in historic preservation from the College of Charleston, um, and which is why I've put her in the book, because, you know, her name is Megan White, but in the book, she's Megan Black, because I'm, you know, very creative that way. <laughs> Let's so disguise met, her a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so we have the Megan Black character, but it was so funny because when I was um, visiting Charleston once with her, and she had just finished writing a paper or, or had actually been restoring the mortar in a building. Mm. And she was showing me which brick she had done. And she explained to me, you know, how the reason why it had to be redone is because it had already been done, but done incorrectly. So they had to dig out the wrong stuff and put in the right stuff. Because I think what she said, it's um, the bricks needed to carry the weight, not the mortar. And the way she explained it made a lot of sense. Of course, I had to throw that in the book, you know? It was, yeah, because you did say it's like the bricks have to carry the load instead of the mortar. Like, I think mm -hmm. that's the line in the book. And I was like, wow, I never really think about that. No, you know? a lot of people don't. And that's why, I mean, if I'm writing about something, I want to make sure that the details matter. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, especially since I have, you know, free research source, so... <laughs> Megan, what's going yeah. on with this? Oh, exactly. I, and I, I just sent her a man, the manuscript for the next book, you know, to make sure because the job that Nola has in the next book is the job my daughter actually has now. So, oh, okay. Oh, oh, we're going to get to that. Mm -hmm. So I, I do remember that we had last time we talked and for anybody who missed that interview, you and Melanie have some of the same traits. Like you both love dogs. There might be some labeling that goes on. That's kind of like the same between you. A OCD. Just a little speak. OCD, a little bit of that I'm not, stuff. I'm neither going to confirm nor, nor deny those rumors. Okay, fine. So like writing her really becomes fun because there's a little inside soul searching at the same time of what's going on. <laughs> yeah, she's like me on steroids. <laughs> you know, it's like, she has a life. I, I mean, I would die if somebody left me a historic home in Charleston. Mm -hmm. I would, that, that is my dream. And that's why I've given May, uh, Melanie my fantasy life, you know, and then she meets this fascinating guy and, you know, Jack. <laughs> it's like, oh, um, here we go, you know, blah, blah, blah. So she's, she's living my dream life. I mean, my life is wonderful. I'm just saying, but if I could live an alternate life, that would be the life I live. Right. And I remember last time your husband had words about living would be a bear to eat the house. Like that's the way he looked. Like exactly. this would be like I, mine would be like, oh wait, everything's gonna break. Like everything's just gonna break. We don't want to do this. Well, well, you know, the house we just moved into, it's not an old, old house, but it is an older house. <laughs> We've had to replace and fix so much already. And we've only been here a month. <laughs> Does he say, I told you so? <laughs> no, he just grumbles. Gives me that like, <laughs> kind of look. Yeah, this is this is exactly what I said was going to happen. This is exactly what I told you would happen. Yeah, exactly. But it's beautiful. I mean, I love it. I love the soaring ceilings that he says, you know, pardon my French, you might have to bleep this out. But whenever I say, oh, can we please buy an historic house? He's like, it's a bitch to heat. <laughs> My, my, my husband's always saying the high ceilings because you have to have fans to put the heat back down. He said, either there, it's going to be a fortune. It's very funny. I know, but then my designer says, but the fans look awful. So we don't have fans. And my husband just, <laughs> he's going to be up there. He's going to be on a ladder doing like this with the air. You know, move air. I know we got, we already removed the one uh, from the master bedroom and put a beautiful lighting fixture there. He's like, where's my fan? <laughs> It's not coming back. It went out to get fixed and it's not coming back. You know, oh my gosh. It was really ugly. But speaking of which, I do love JJ and his whisk. I mean, oh, I know, right? carries the whisk. 
Now, where did this idea come from? This okay, just just let people know who JJ is because we've dropped him in here. He's this young child. <laughs> He's a baby, one of twins. So JJ and Sarah are twins, and in the attic on Queen Street, they're I think eighteen months, I believe. Yeah. And um, so he and his sister are as different as Jack and Melanie are, and JJ is is short for Jack Jr. Um, and then Sarah is named after Melanie's grandmother who has the sixth sense. And we suspect that Sarah has inherited it. Um, but JJ, I don't know where the whisk came from, but you know, my kids both had their little loveys. My, my daughter's was a little stuffed bunny and my son was a um, Humpty Dumpty doll. But he, yeah. Um, so I think every kid has to have a lovey. It's just, I mean, my little dog, Sophie has um, Eeyore, you know, a little stuffed Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh mostly because my husband and I like saying, you know, have you seen Sophie's ass? Cause we're always, you know, she, she won't go to sleep without him. <laughs> so JJ had to have something and I don't know where it came from, but it's a whisk because kids are so strange. We just, we don't know where it comes from, but he sleeps with a whisk. That is his, that is his lovey item, a whisk. And in an earlier book, I have a throwaway comment from a character, Thomas Riley, the detective, who eventually is uh, in a serious relationship with Melanie's sister, Jane. And he mentions offhandedly that his sister is a chef in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking there could be maybe, maybe JJ wants to be a chef one day and maybe he wants to do an internship at a restaurant in New Orleans. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Well, I, I love how these throwaway comments in different books, all of a sudden I see like, like my subconscious has this big Machiavellian plan that comes together, you know, like Nola's name. I right. just threw that out, you know, that she's named after the city of New Orleans, Louisiana by her mother um, as sort of like a joke because she was, her real name is um, Amelia Evangeline named after her two grandmothers. But her, her mother calls her Nola because she was conceived in a cheap motel room in New Orleans. <laughs> and Nola is very proud to, to say that out loud to anybody who asks. Right. Which makes her stepmother just crazy because she goes, it wasn't me. It wasn't, it wasn't me. Yeah. I've it never conceived me. a child in a cheap motel room. It would be an expensive hotel room in New Orleans. Yes, or yes. <laughs> but it's so funny because this child with the whisk, it's like one of those things you just sit there and go, wait, oh, wait, is this little OCD thing or whatever? What's going on with him? And then I like towards the end of the book, we're seeing everybody a little bit progressed along, which I won't give anything away except to say he's still holding the whisk. Mm -hmm. And I love that little line that he's on the swing, still holding the whisk. So I'm like, <laughs> because kids are like that, you know, they're little loveys, they go with them everywhere. So I just thought the whisk was fun. <laughs> the whisk is totally fun. Totally fun. So typically you've told us that you don't outline your books. You don't outline. And this one, did you do any kind of prep to know all the little things you had to wrap up because you're wrapping up a series? Did you actually sit there? <laughs> no, Carol, I didn't do that. That would have been so helpful. <laughs> it would have been helpful. I and, you know, in my real life, I'm very organized and very detail oriented. Why I can't write a book that way. I, I, I don't know. I just, I feel like I need to torture myself when I write. I had no idea. I will say that I hired um, a friend of mine, her daughter, millennial, I guess she's 29, probably almost 30. She just got married, actually. She, um, she worked on Broadway and as um, during quarantine, she was out of work. She wasn't getting paid. She was completely you know, out of work and she was looking for ways to make uh, money. And I remembered her, um, she's so detail oriented and so amazing. And so I said, hey, can you read the entire series and write a Trad Street Bible? Mm. So that I know what happens in each book, what color people's eyes are, who their parents are, when they were born, where they were born, where they went to school, any kind of identifying <laughs> information about them. If you could just write that down and do a, and do a family tree while you're at it. <laughs> she did. And that was huge, hugely helpful. Yeah. And then I had her read the attic on Queen Street. And I said, write down all the information about Bo Ryan, because I knew 
that I might be using him in another book. Yeah. And we're going to, yep, we're definitely going to talk about that because it's like, oh, these moments of maybe this is going to crop up again. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because it is that Bible, you know, speaking of Bible, has there ever been any film or series interest in these books? Because I feel like these would be perfect, like a I perfect know. Netflix I series. Know. Totally. So I was actually paid by 20th Century Fox about five years ago. Mm -hmm. I was even talking now about actors. We'd gotten that far and then boom, it fell apart. I got to keep the money, but nothing ever happened. Mm -hmm. um, let's just say right now there is some movement and that direction, I'm very excited about it mm -hmm. um, because I agree, this would make such a fabulous series, either limited series or just a series that could go on and on and on and on because there's there so, is much, so material. much material. And <laughs> Charleston itself is such a character. Yes. I mean, you know, not, not to disparage, you know, The Bachelorette or other shows that are on TV right now, but really <laughs> right no honestly no I was really there was like, better stuff out there we can be watching you know it's like a plot maybe I was I feel the same way but I was reading this book and I was like wait a second this would be so perfect because it's a set cast of characters in a set place mm -hmm. it's all contained it's all you could shoot this all up and recreate up in um where they shoot up in uh canada uh, i can't remember city they always shoot up vancouver well, atlanta too but i think charleston would be i if, mean but if they can't shoot there you can recreate so much of the interiors and go there for the exteriors mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i don't know i just sat there thinking totally that doable yeah totally doable if anybody's it's listening any producer listening because i agree and i get that question all the time yeah, because so. it's like it's all made it's all like there it's it's mm -hmm. completely their cast of characters and everything and mm -hmm. that that book may come in very very handy that bible mm -hmm. come in very mm -hmm. handy mm -hmm. you know it, at one point jack's editor has all kinds of strange suggestions for him which is pretty <laughs> funny like and i was just laughing to this and is there any ode to what publishing feedback can be like not necessarily feedback you've gotten but just sometimes the bizarre stuff that you hear that like this would be a great idea and you're like Am I right? Like, can we change this character into a dog? That is a real thing. I mean, it's years old, but I, I just remember the author telling me and I was just like, you, you, you can't be serious. Yep. Luckily, I've never, I mean, my editor is amazing. I've, I mean, she's, she, she has a good head on her shoulders. She would never say something like that. But honestly, the things I've heard from other authors, it, it just blows the mind. Yeah. 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 And I just thought there was that little nugget in there of like, hmm, you think this business is all together? Well, let me tell you what this person is saying was very, very funny. Right. Very funny. It's like, the, you know, there's a, um, a series uh, that's based on a book called Younger, yes. and which is yes. set in the publishing world. And when they have the crazy authors on, I'm like, yeah, I'm sure they exist, but are they going to show the crazy editors too? <laughs> no, they go both ways. I have to go like, but sometimes you'd be sitting there and you realize that there are authors that are coming and having these conversations. And you can just imagine, like, I just can imagine having a marketing meeting with some people where you really just do not have a grasp of that, like what is going to happen. And we're right. like, yeah, can we can we get the author to pose without a shirt? It's like, <laughs> male, male author, obviously, but it's like, wow, really, you know, and let's have Kim Kardashian give an give a quote. Yeah, the editors never read any of this person's books. No, <laughs> no, no. Or, or could you get a blurb from so and so? And I'm like, I don't think it's going to go that way. I don't yeah. think that's really going to happen. It's very, yeah. very funny. Yeah, yeah. Char Charleston is such a great setting, and I know you just drove back from there today. I figure mm -hmm. your car can just go back and forth by itself at this point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you always know you wanted to set the series there. Like, were you always sure that was location? No, because, you know, originally it was supposed to be uh, set in New Orleans because I know New Orleans. I went to college at Tulane, so I lived there for four years. Great friends in New Orleans. I visited often. And um, so when I first started thinking about the series, I had planned to set in New Orleans, but that was 2005. Mm. And I remember in April of 2005, I dragged my family to New Orleans, drag, um, you know, to research, meaning eat at all the restaurants, do a lot of tours, walk around, have fun. And um, 
you know, so it's all set and ready to go. And then we know what happened on August 29th in 2005. Sadly, we had a storm called Katrina pay an ugly visit to the city. And I knew at that point that there was no room in the series for something as big as Katrina. Mm -hmm. um, I did go back and I wrote The Beach Trees, which was sort of my tribute to the Gulf Coast and the storms we survive. Um, but I knew for this series, I needed to find another great Southern city with lots of history, great architecture, and of course, plenty of ghosts. And Charleston was, was the obvious Sorry. pick. Um, and it's so funny, I don't want to call, you know, Katrina a serendipitous event, but I have to say that I cannot imagine Jack and Melanie and the rest of these characters um, the story taking place in any other place besides Charleston. So it, it worked out. It worked out in the end. It did work out. It completely worked out. And recently you had a Trad Street event with your readers in Charleston. This, I think this was the second or the third one? Third. Second third. Or mm -hmm. third. Mm -hmm. So tell us what that is, because this is one of those things I wish I could have attended that weekend. But tell us so what happens, because it sounds so much fun. So this is really the brainchild of the amazing Polly Buxton of Buxton Bookstore on King Street in New Orleans, excuse me, in Charleston. And you all need to go visit Buxton Bookstore. It is one of the premier independent booksellers in the country. They are amazing. They also do walking tours. They do amazing walking tours, great haunted book tours, and they also do a trad street walking tour where you get to visit all the sites in the trad street series. But um, Polly is from Charleston. She knows Charleston. And um, she put together these extravaganzas. It's like three day events at Charleston places where people come from all, readers of the series come from all over the country and Canada to really experience Charleston with me. You know, there's, um, it, they've all been a little different, but, um, you know, we visit historic sites, we do events together in historic site, uh, we have tours and graveyards that aren't open to regular tours, um, really make it a special, special event um, with special goodie bags, signed books by me. Um, signed books by Julian Buxton, who um, Polly's husband, who has written the Ghosts of Charleston uh, mm -hmm. book, which is amazing. And, um, you know, lots of food events, drinking events, and plenty of time also to explore the city on your own. So um, really a whole lot of fun. And I don't know what we're going to do next, but I'm sure Polly has something up her sleeve. So yeah, you could do something when the paperback comes out or something. Because I think or something the, because or something. It's something. they're really so much fun, and the people that come just have a blast, and um, I have a blast. It's really my favorite part of touring is those Trad Street weekends, and we've done three. And with the last book in the series, you know. I don't know what'll happen next. Oh, is there a touch of sadness when the series ends, when the writing of it ends? Is there a little bit of, I mean, we'll talk about what's coming next, but it sounds like it's going to be amazing, but right. is there a little like, like the end? Oh, the end. It, it, but you know what? It wasn't so bad because I knew what was coming mm -hmm. and I was prepared. And that is why in this book, I really set up what is coming next. So so to me, that next book, so this book wasn't really the end. It was just sort of the launching pad for the next book. Mm -hmm. So I didn't feel that sadness that I actually felt when I wrote the end on the return to Trad Street, because that the fourth book was supposed to be the last book in the series. And because I wasn't ready to say goodbye, I snuck in a little epilogue, which is basically an anonymous letter to the editor of the Charleston Post and Courier saying they did not believe that all of the bones hidden at the property at 55 Trad Street had yet been discovered. And I waited to see if my editor at Penguin would take the bait. And luckily she did. And they asked for three more, which is how we got uh, the guests on South Battery, the Christmas Spirits on Trad Street, and then the last book, The, the, the Attic on Queen Street, which is indeed the final book in the Trad Street series, but perhaps not the last time we will see these characters. Oh, no. And we will be getting into that because we she's definitely set up the next book, folks. It's not joking around. You just got to read this one carefully. So <laughs> is 
This one though, Amy Bruneau once again narrates and she really is Melanie. So yeah. I know that you love audiobooks. Do you listen to your own? Do you listen to your own books? I don't. Um, I would love to. I've listened to snippets and um, Amy Brunel is is phenomenal. She is Melanie. She has read all seven of the books in the series. And she actually sent me a lovely email um, when she finished narrating the last one saying what an honor it was to play Melanie. And she's won awards for her narration of Melanie. Um, I wish I could use her again, but she's so, she's so tied to the voice of Melanie. I know I can't use her for another one of my books, but she's phenomenal. Um, yeah, so um, I listen to audiobooks. I haven't listened to my own only because I have a bazillion books I want to listen to. Right. And I already know how my books are going to end. So You know how it ends. You know how it yeah. wraps. You know, da, da. So the cover this time, what did you... Okay, so the house is the house that's in the book. Is this the house, the exterior? Is yeah, it so I all I said when they asked me when they were in a cover conference, I said it just has to be yellow how a yellow Victorian. That's okay. all I said. And then sorry, just came from Charleston where I had two people come up to me and say, Oh my gosh, that's the Satili house on the College of Charleston campus. It used to be a dorm. And the two women who came to me said they lived in that house when they were at the College of Charleston. And the first time I've heard of it, I'm like, okay, sure, that's the house, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the people at Penguin used, the art people used as a model for that house, but I didn't send them the picture or anything. Wow, very, very good. Ooh, could it be coincidence? Could it be coincidence? Could, have, could somebody in the arts department have gone to the College of Charleston and said, I know what house to use? You know, Possibly. No. Possibly, or somebody but, you know, Jack says there's no such thing as coincidence. There are no coincidences. Everything just happens to evolve, you know, mm -hmm. da, da, da. and happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's get, stop joking around about the next series. Let's start like hinting around. Okay. It's hinted at the end of the book. It's going to be a spin-off series set in New Orleans, New Orleans. <laughs> featuring Melanie's stepdaughter, whose name is Nola. And who is also going to crap up, prop up, prop up is Bo, who is the new character that's been in this book that, okay, careful readers, I fold down pages as I read. I thought he might be somebody important. I fold it down and guess what? I was right. Yes. So can you tell us about the shop on Royal Street? Yes. So the shop on Royal Street. So first of all, let me tell you a little bit about Bo, who you meet in the attic on Queen Street. Mm -hmm. He's from New Orleans. His family for generations has owned an antique store on Royal Street. So he is in Charleston in the attic on Queen Street, uh, going to school at the um, College of Art and Design and working part time at Trenum Antiques, which is how he rubs elbows with the Trenums and Nola and Melanie and the rest of them. Um, and there are two things that Melanie notices about Bo. One is that he has a set of wet footprints. So we know we know, we find out about Bo that his both parents and his little sister disappeared during Hurricane Katrina. And Melanie notices that a pair of wet footprints about women's size follows him around. She also realizes that he probably has the sixth sense as she does, but is in deep denial about it. And as a matter of fact, he own, he runs a podcast called um, it, Debunking So-Called Psychic Mediums uh, called Things That Go Bump in the Night or something like that. I have to look it up. But anyway, so in the shop on Royal Street, which, by the way, comes out March 29th of next year. That is only four months, y'all. Yeah. That's yeah. only four what months. Is sleep? Right what is she went really so fast, crazy. folks. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it comes out March 29th. So we were going to advance a few years. Mel, um, um, Nola is now about 27, oh, which means okay. her brother and sister are about 12. So it's about uh, 10 years later. Um, Nola has had some bumps uh, during college and now she has a master's degree in historic preservation, um, but she's had some bumps in the road. She has recently moved to New Orleans to start her new job as an architectural historian for a civil engineering firm. And she has just bought her first house, a uh, sort of rundown Creole cottage in the Maroney neighborhood of New Orleans. And Melanie, of course, comes to help her with the sale. And uh, that's when they discovered that there are several restless spirits 
um, at least two in the house, but Nola doesn't care because she's not, she can't see them. She's not disturbed by them, but it comes very clear to Melanie that they need to be eradicated if Nola is ever going to live happily ever after in her new house. And she thinks Bo, who is returned to New Orleans, um, might be the person to help her. So. Ooh, there we go. There we go. There is the set up. <laughs> mm-hmm, so- mm-hmm. Besides- and there's other stuff and other characters. And I'm just, I love the first book. I, I really hope that readers love it as much as they embraced uh, the um, the house on Trad Street. Yeah. Well, it sounds like we've got the same vibes going. So I could it's see Same it. vibes, but you know, and that was that was the the challenge was to have kind of the same vibe, vibe, but make it um, fresh and, and, and new as well. And I think think I've succeeded. My editor thinks I've succeeded. Um, and that's why I moved it to New Orleans. New Orleans and Charleston are very similar. Um, of course, Charleston is called the Holy City, whereas New Orleans is called the Big Easy. And there we go. <laughs> so there we go from there. I feel like your car used to go to Charleston like this. Now your car just goes down to New Orleans like this. Did you go down yeah. and do research or did you remember everything? Uh, oh, please. I did a research trip uh, this past June. So I <laughs> you know, cause I believe in suffering for my craft. I ate in a ton of restaurants. I, um, you know, I drank in a lot of the bars. As a matter of fact, my head, my husband came with me and he said, my gosh, this is the first time I've ever had bourbon at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> this is New Orleans, you know, I just know that I could, couldn't live in New Orleans again because a, I would weigh a thousand pounds and I would also be an alcoholic. So yeah, just it is a fun, great, beautiful city, and I love it. I have good friends that still live there, and I think the biggest difference between New Orleans and Charleston. So um, in Charleston, they have palmetto bugs. Mm-hmm. In New Orleans, they have the same things, but they call them what they are: flying cockroaches. <laughs> so, huge bugs. Huge bugs. Huge. Huge. You can hear the wings. You know, and they're big enough to open your screen door. So don't bother. (laughs) It was, it's funny because I was thinking about that. My son, my younger son was just in New Orleans a couple of weeks ago. And he said, you just walk down the street with a beer. It's open carry. He goes, wow, I was like loving this. And they were staying in a B and B, and actually he was working in between. And I said, "Do you go out and get beignets?" And he's like, well, "Well, we'll go over there later." And he was going out to dinner at Mr. B's because my husband had recommended yes. he was have the barbecue shrimp. Yeah. And I said to him, "Well, you need to go to the Carousel Bar that is over at in the Montelion on Royal Street." Mm-hmm. So I said, "You Absolutely. need to go to this." And he was just looking like, "What are you talking about with these things?" And I said, "No, there are certain things that are iconic that you need to do if you're in the city." And Absolutely. He was just like, okay, this is where I need to go then. I said, yeah, I'll just, you just hop on the carousel bar. But you're right. The other thing is probably somebody from New Orleans is going to like write me and, you know, I say green vegetable, except for okra, none. Like there was never a salad on the menu. And I came home from two business trips down there, easily five pounds over like what I had left with. And I was like, did I just- Didn't you enjoy every bite? Every bite was fantastic. Yeah. Lots of bites. Yeah. Lots of bites. Yeah. 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 So, and that is, you know, I love Charleston. It, it, it is my favorite city. And I adore New Orleans as well. But the one thing, the one thing that New Orleans really beats Charleston hands down, cuisine. Mm-hmm. I mean, I love the Charleston. I mean, fabulous. Great places. Yep. But New Orleans, it's like several notches above. I, I've never had a bad meal in New Orleans. And because I have friends from there, they know the little, you know, nook and cranny places that the tourists don't know about where you can get the best jambalaya, the best red beans and rice, you know, the best barbecue shrimp, you know, that look at a little hole in the walls, but they're amazing. I remember going for the Camilla Grill for pecan pancakes. Oh, yes. And it's which pecan. <laughs> With pecan, pecan pancakes, and they were just brilliant. And I really is my favorite eatery. Oh my, I mean, it's so close to Tulane's campus. I mean, you'd go there at three in the morning and have your chili cheese omelet, you know, then you'd go next door through the drive through and get DAC, you know, drive through DAC. It's just, it's so like, you know, just crazy to sit there and think about like how different the city is. And it's the city that doesn't sleep. It, yeah. And my son said the second night he wanted to just go eat on a balcony someplace because that looked like fun. Mm-hmm. And I said, it's all these little, these little touches, these little places that 
you don't really think about until you're down there. And it's like so much of what the city is like. It is it's just so much, so much. And the music, if you go to the Marinade, not so much the quarter in the more, the quarter has really become touristy. But if mm-hmm. you go to the Marini, which is where Nola's house is going to be, that is the new, that is the it place for music. And, you know, just to hear it, the jazz and the blues played, you know, from all, all the music venues that are the now on Frenchman Street is just, intoxicating that's like what new orleans is Mm -hmm. um you know while while walking down the street drinking your beer or whatever (laughs) or your hurricane or yeah when he just sat there and he said he's doing that i was like oh i forgot i really forgot you get a to-go cup you know you're a go cup and you're set yeah go cup and set for life you know Mm -hmm. but there's gonna be so much atmosphere so also i remember there was a stack of of, uh, coffee table books at your house about charleston yes is there a big stack now about New Orleans? So you make oh, sure. Oh, yes, I've got them. Right? Um, I can't show you now because there's boxes over there. But um, oh, yeah. So now I have all my New Orleans books. New Orleans books. Sure. New Orleans mm-hmm. books. Okay. So, yeah, you raise a few flags. We're ready for those little Easter eggs. Anybody who's reading, you know, this book, you've got to just be paying very careful attention because you're going to yeah. get all kinds of little things. But in addition to writing solo and to being on TikTok and all these other things, no, 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 that is not enough for Karen Way. You also write books with Beatrice Williams and Lauren Willig, and you're referred to as Team W. So Mm -hmm. what's next for the three of you? We're so excited. Um, In May, May 17th, um, yes, we have our next book uh, set in Newport, Rhode Island called The Lost Summers of Newport. And the time periods are 1899, 1957, and modern day. And you will see a return of Megan Black. Ooh, ooh, just slid in there, slid in there. So wait a second. Why not? (laughs) I read up on this book this afternoon. It's a novel about money and secrets set among the famous summer mansions of Newport, Rhode Island, spanning over a century from the Gilded Age to present. Mm -hmm. So did you get to spend any time up in Newport or did the pandemic keep you from there? Well, the pandemic, we were supposed to go in April of 2020. Obviously that wasn't going to happen. Happily, the three of us all were vaccinated this past August. Ooh. So we were able to spend time there. We did an amazing event at the Ocean House in Rhode Island. Um, and then we did, we f- we finished up the Newport book and did all of our final whatever. And while we were there, sent it to our editor. So um, yay. Well, there used to be, I remember for these trips, this was, uh, wait a second, you get together for your trip and plan the next book out. Mm -hmm. So pandemic happens, luckily, you know, location. So like what happened? I mean, for the planning, normally we get together the planning, then we go our separate ways and then we get together at the end. So for the planning, we had to do FaceTime, which I mean, we had our signature cocktails going, which, but it's just not the same. The three of us together are just it's just a thing. It's the unibrain. Just that whole thing happens. Exactly. And it's still have it was just a little harder, a little more disconnected. But the book, I, I think it was worth the trauma because the book is, was well worth it. And then we were so lucky to be able to meet in August to finish the book and send it in. So we are now looking at um, getting together to, we've art, like when we were there in Newport, we started talking about the next book. We've already been contracted for it. Um, So we're planning uh, where we're gonna go for our next, uh, our planning meeting. So that'll be fun. I just know it has to be somewhere warm or you can't go in winter because Karen doesn't wanna go because she's not, not gonna get cold. No, no, they owe me for taking me to New Hampshire in November a few years ago to plan one of our books. I'm just like, no. No, it was hell happy. for me. Hell. I don't not do happy. Cold. like right now. It's like I'm a little chilly. I got to go crank up the heat to 78 or something because I just can't <laughs> I can't live in this chill in Georgia in winter. It was no, like 61 degrees today. My gosh, I think it's about 38 here. <laughs> 40, you know? No, no, no. We can't have you come north. No, no, no. You can't. Not in the winter. Mm-hmm. No, nope. not happening. Nope. Did you guys besides doing FaceTime, did you Zoom a lot to talk to each other over the West? We haven't West? Zoomed except for events, but normally, and, mm. and our text chains are, are, are epic. We'll probably have them published after our deaths. Yeah, they're, <laughs> they're wonderful. Yeah. You so get you to know the Zoom. real Team W. So you didn't Zoom. It's so funny. I pictured the three of you on like during the day. Oh, what are you doing now? Da, da, da. Very interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, just FaceTime for scheduling. But you remember um, Lauren was quarantined with two small children. So it was hard to get, you know, dedicated time. So texts are really the best way with her because she, you know, catches catch can, you know, with her. Um, you know, I'm a little more flexible and Beatrice now too. She has four kids, but two are in college. So um, yeah, the whole quarantine thing was just like, really? I was thinking about that. I was like, wait, these people usually get together. This is really not good. Oh, it was like, we were not happy. I mean, yes you know, I'm, I'm not making fun of COVID or no, whatever. It was no. a serious thing, but it's, you know, you don't, I mean, it touched everybody's lives and of course with us as well, but yeah, you know, we, we miss getting together. We're dear friends. We write together and we need that vitamin W as we call it, um, you know, for our writing. So, but we, we made up for lost term, time in August for sure. I bet. But you know, what's really interesting too, is you did not have a book coming out in 2020. I remember you said to me, I don't have a book. And you didn't have a book coming out in 2020. And you're like, oh, first year I don't have a book. And I remember writing it going, I don't think this is a bad thing. I think this is no. really okay. but it wasn't that I had any relaxation time. I think because the, the first book that came out in 2021, that was supposed to come out in 2020 was really late because I had things in my personal life that just you know, pulled the rug out from under me. And I, it was just, I, I couldn't turn a book in on time if you put a gun to my head. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so I was trying to play catch up in 2021. It's not like I had extra time. It was just, I was trying to make up for the time that I lost in 2019. Um, so yeah, well, I wouldn't call it extra productive for me. It was just, you know, running to catch up and I'm still like treading water, trying to keep my head above water. Well, I just realized this is book 25. Wow. Of the no, ones no, that... 30, but who's counting? 30? Really? I was yeah. counting the front of the book. Okay. I guess they're not all in the front of the book. Okay. Well, no, it's 25. And then you're besides your co-writing. So am I wrong? Oh, it, oh I count. Besides, my, yeah, co-writing. yeah. Besides co-writing. So mm-hmm. the, the ones you've done in your solo career. So the writing get any easier as time goes on. I mean, besides you don't have children in the house right now, does it get any easier or no? No, no, it doesn't. It's still like opening up a vein. And, and because now social media has really bisected my writing time, I just find it harder to carve time. It's, it's really a challenge. Yeah. It's funny. Cause I was going in with that with a question. My next question was going to be like, how much has this really, you know, this thinking and willing to share with readers has it d- helped to, you know, done to the writing time and does the promotion aspect of publishing have an effect on your writing as you hear so much more from readers I mean it's just it goes back and forth no absolutely and I feel terrible when I don't get to my emails for a couple of days or and I like I never check my Facebook messages and I know I've got tons in there but honestly I don't and you know when I finally get into bed like at 11 o'clock at night I'm you know I'm like I'll check some emails now and I'm I fall asleep as soon as my head hits the pillow I just can't do anymore and I need my sleep so right. yeah it's I'm I'm struggling I'm struggling it, it, it is I don't think you're the only author we're saying that because as I said you're juggling well with your solo writing writing with two other authors show social media touring oh and planning parents, your daughter's wedding parents. elderly parents yeah elderly parents huge right now huge, huge. Um, and planning your daughter's wedding and yeah. moving I mean yeah. just I think moving while the book comes out and on tour was a really great Karen yeah. tour de force. I just yeah. realized, you know, we closed on this house November 2nd and um, I have actually spent four nights in my house because I went on tour and, and I got my revisions for the uh, shop on Royal street on the same day as you moved yes. mm. and started book tour. And luckily they come digitally or they might not have gotten packed. <laughs> exactly. But I turned them in this past Monday, killed me, Wow. did it. And then wow. I got copy edits for the revisions for, excuse me, copy edits for the collaboration, which I turned in on Friday while wow. I was on tour. Wow. Wow. Yeah. This is a lot. Yeah. Like, but you know, it's one of those things where when you stop, you sit there and go, what did I just do? Oh my no, gosh. I have, I have no idea. I have, I am, I've, I'm teaching myself how to be AD and A. DD. Right. Because I'm so pulled and yeah, you know, wine helps and caffeine is a huge help. So I think that also we do have to assess what are we doing and what's working and what don't we don't want right. to do. Anymore. And, and would, would this hour be better served with me just sitting in bed, watching TV, mindless TV. And sometimes the answer is yes, because my brain 
needs to shut down. Mm -hmm. It was just mm -hmm. like, I was late with the attic on Queen Street because life happens. You know, we were about to put our other house on the market <laughs> and we needed to have the septic tank replaced, but we were living on a steep hill, which meant we need bulldozers in and we couldn't find the septic tank. So then they had to dig up our backyard. <laughs> you know what? And you just have to go, I'm healthy. My family's healthy. You know, these are the blessings in life and that's what you focus on. And I have this wonderful career that I'm so blessed to be part of. I love my readers. My readers are the best. I love hearing for them. So I don't, I don't want to complain, but I have to think that it's been a lot. <laughs> this year has been a lot, you know, I feel that so way. I'm looking at authors and seeing how much they're doing. And I realize it is a lot. And I think that it's like, okay, what could be a Q&A on my website? What could be like something where I'm just going to go out there and there are answers to the, this next week, give me your questions. And I'm going to post all the answers there so that somebody doesn't have to worry about missing them on social media on a given day. And that, that post gets pinned to the top and yeah. said, this is what we're doing and this is how we're going to do it. And I'm thinking that, we need like a little bit of like, okay, this is what I will be doing. And this is what I won't be doing because right. it's really right. hard right now. And I would love to have a handler <laughs> to tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what I need a handler mm -hmm. because I'm too busy thinking about my books and my family mm -hmm. that thinking about what I need to do next on my social media or on my website or whatever. It's, mm -hmm. I, well, I just can't keep it. You also do together. a great newsletter. You do a great newsletter that goes out yes. and that goes and out. I have help with that. You know, we work on it together and then she makes it beautiful and sends it out. So thank God I have Rena. She's yeah. amazing, worth her weight in gold. So there are some things that I do have help with and she, yeah. I couldn't do without her. Yeah. But I'm sitting there like looking at that newsletter and I was like, that is a gift. Like that is a really great piece. And how can some of the things that are there be repurposed onto social media? So we're not saying the same thing, same thing like over, figuring, over. Out to, right. figuring out how to say it in all these different places. I don't right. know. I'm, right. well, we're, we're doing the same thing, looking at our stuff. Somebody said to me, she was doing TikTok and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, clone. I know, right? It's, it's clone. I mean, I love watching TikTok videos, you know, but in my in my spare time <laughs> which before means I go I to sleep become... before I go to sleep I watch TikTok Wait, and then I fall asleep with you know clutching I'll I'll wake up in the morning and I'm, I have a crick in my neck because I've literally fallen asleep like this because I'm too tired to put my head on the pillow it's good it's, it's a it's good a problem to have it is you really know? good but it's also figuring out okay well how can I streamline this and keep my sanity you yeah. Know? Yeah. And enjoy that. And my, my main goal is to enjoy this mm -hmm. because I love it. I love hearing from readers, but how can I streamline where I, and how I hear from readers and how mm -hmm. I respond to them? Because I can't look at 14 different spots and respond. Well, it's, some people have said that they turn off comments. They turn off the direct messaging Mm -hmm. And you can only comment on the page and then they can see what it is. So, and you know, that that's a good plan. And I try to redirect everybody to my email because my email, I do schedule time during the day to answer mm -hmm. emails. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't schedule times to, you know, to do Facebook messages or Instagram messages because there is no time. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. I mean, there are days where I don't eat because mm -hmm. I'm so busy doing stuff. I'm like, I'll eat in five minutes. I'm hungry. And then I get busy and then I forget. And then I'm, I wake up in the middle of the night because I'm starving. I'm like, I need to eat. Well, it's really funny because working from home, everybody goes, oh, you must have so much free time. And I'm like, I mean, the time I go down, I put the food in the microwave, hit it on five minutes. And there are times I say the five minute macaroni and cheese in the box. Yes. I can't do, I have to do the three minute thing. Right. Right. If it's still half frozen, I'll just shove it in my face until I go into the next thing. Yeah. This is like, I actually put, this is really funny on this floor of the house. We actually put a little refrigerator that I put like bottles of uh, the sparkling water that I drink in. That's all that's in that refrigerator, but it's easier than going downstairs. And that's pitiful. I mean, that is just pitiful to admit, but it will save me. It'll be three more paragraphs in the newsletter folks, because I didn't have to go downstairs, you know, no, there you go. There you go. There you, go. you find ways to do it, but finding the joy for me right now is because there's so much good stuff going on. It is. It's just, is. I'm frantic that I can't pause to enjoy it. 
I think that you're on such a roll. I can't wait for the next book. Like I said, people, I love this one. You can go read all seven books and have a great experience. And this one was number 14 on the New York Times list. I'm very excited. Yes. Really? On the combined really? list. Yes. Mm -hmm. I am super excited. Super oh, excited yeah. for you. Yeah. Totally, totally good. Well, I look forward to the next book so we can chat again. Yes. We have to meet up in New Orleans. March. My gosh, that's only for, oh my gosh. Yes, that would be a business expense, right? If you right? interviewed me in person. Yeah, we meet in person in and hang out down there. Mm -hmm. We must think. We must mm -hmm. think. Okay. And moderate an event for you. <laughs> because it's, you know, work. Totally at work. Wherever we go would be work. From the minute we got off the plane, even being so on work, the work, plane. work, work, as Team W says, work, 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 work. That's all we do when we're together. Work, work, work. There's no fun. No fun, all. no drinking, no partying, no, no nothing. No. no. Well, you keep work, work, working. And I look forward to seeing you next time because it's always a blast. Thank you, Cheryl. This is always a blast talking to you. And I can't wait to come back to New York when we can and see you in person. We'll come out. I will definitely leave my house and come out and see you. How's that? I'll go into New York, okay? I know because now nobody's leave. nobody's in New York now. It's now, crazy. It's very, very, it's very, very strange. It's very, very, I haven't been there since uh, December 2020, believe it or not. I've had no reason to go into the city. That's it's crazy. So bizarre. And meanwhile, I went every day for how many years? You know, I know. So, yeah. right. you and you drove. I remember that. That was just yes. crazy. So. Yeah, I've I've a lot more free time to do things like this. <sighs> no, I agree. I agree. So thank you. This has been a pleasure. Can't wait to pleasure. see you in person. Can't wait to chat again, whether in person or zooming again. Or, or zooming again. And to our readers, look forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter yes, Talks too.